Hello and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged History. That's really, I just think this is such an important topic and I'm so excited to have someone help me go through this because, you know, I studied history when I was at school. I've read a lot of history books. I'm a bit of a history, amateur history nerd. I do love the topic of history and I just think it's so important that we try and learn from our previous mistakes, of which we have ample evidence that we're not really doing that at the moment, and we really should be. But to help me uh, discuss particularly the history of electric vehicles, but also the history of the oil industry, of what oil has done to the world, how it's changed the world in many ways for the better, in some ways very negatively. Um, and so I needed to find someone who was really good at history. Well, I was very lucky a few years ago, I worked on a BBC series about the Mumbai Suburban Railway Network. So not the big trains that go right across India with people on the roof that you may have seen footage of. These are the, the commuter trains that go in and out of Mumbai Central Station, thousands of them. It was the most amazing experience. Spent a couple of, I don't know what, uh, six, six weeks, I think, in, in India in two different blocks. And I was working there with a man called Dan Snow. Now, Dan is an absolute delight. Outside the UK, uh, you, may, you may not have heard of him. He is a, a, a historian. He runs an amazing channel called uh, History Hit TV. Worth looking that up. I'll put a link below beneath this. And he's just an absolute charmer. He's an absolute delight. He's a very tall guy. You're not going to be able to probably see that in the interview I've done with him, but he is a very tall man. And that's an abiding memory I have of standing on uh, the, the Mumbai Central Station, one of the platforms, early in the morning when it was the rush hour, and I was standing with the camera crew, and Dan just stood still in the middle of the platform as these these absolute beautiful waves of wonderful colour clothing of thousands, tens of thousands of people came off the train, and he was like swallowed up in this sea, but because he's so tall, he was like head and shoulders above everybody else as the thousands of people got off these trains and then the trains zoom out again and another one would come in and then another load of that. It's just it, the logistics of how they run the Mumbai Rail Network it is mind-boggling and really, really impressive. It was altogether an extraordinary experience. So I really enjoyed doing that. I've wanted to work with Dan on other things. You know, we were hoping to be able to shoot something in Bewley, which is a motor museum where they have some old electric cars. We wanted to shoot something there, which is very near where he lives. Not possible. But we've done, I reckon, the next best thing, which is have a really good natter about the history of um, transportation and energy in the 20th and 21st century. So please welcome to Fully Charge, Mr. Dan Snow. <laughs> So Dan, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm so glad because there's an, uh, my little obsession from some of the early research I did was about was that the stuff I really, really didn't know that electric cars had existed. Well, from well, actually for longer than internal combustion engine cars. I mean, they, they came first, which I had no idea about. That's right. Isn't it extraordinary that yeah. in fact, I live very close to Bewley Motor Museum, which is one of the uh, one of the biggest and most important car museums in the world. And, and there they have a steam driven car. So as you can imagine, in the late 18th century, 19th centuries, they were working with all kind of propulsion systems. Yeah. And, and and steam initially seems you know, basically trackless trains. It didn't locomotive. It didn't, it didn't seem uh, a stupid idea. Um, and then they started as soon as people were aware of electricity they started using electricity and in fact it was as you point out you know it was in, in, it's been around longer than internal combustion engines and for a big chunk of that history as indeed arguably today it was a lot more attractive but as a, as a technology as a means of achieving forward motion yeah uh, both in terms of the users right and and then also in terms of uh, just, just they just, but they kind of they work better, they're more effective, but also they're a lot less, they're a lot less unpleasant. And yeah, you know, yeah. Crankshafts and gear changes and all that kind of stuff, and they yeah. didn't smell and pour out noxious fumes. They, people talk about the golden age of electric cars, don't they? Which is basically 1900 to the to the First World War. Yeah. And I think something like a third of cars um, on the streets of of Manhattan, of New York City, were electric, which is, yeah. which is unimaginable. Yeah. Um, Although we may be returning to those days <laughs> very soon. Naturally. Well, I mean, yeah, because that was the, the statistic with that. So the car, they, they introduced this petrol uh, or gasoline uh, taxi cab, which I, and the detail I loved was that the fuel was stored in a glass jar <laughs> that was strapped with a leather strap to the back of the passenger seats. <laughs> And that was how you, because they didn't have, you know, that we always think, oh, you just put petrol in a tank. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have, they, didn't have, they, got, the, they got the gasoline from a chemist for a start. It was the only people who stocked it because it was a cleaning fluid. 
and they uh, and, but there, and that was, it was banned on day one because it backfired. It sent sparks out and smoke, and the horses freaked out because still there was thousands of horses still in use. And all the other taxis, and there were something like 870, were all electric. And they had charge points, battery ch- swapping stations. In, this is all in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. And they were, installing home, they were installing home charge points. All home stuff. charges, yes. So very much technology <laughs> future. And I've driven an electric car around Manhattan for a TV show that I once made. And right. it, it, you'd see why they're so fantastic. One of them went 100 miles on one charge. Um, and these and, were these were old vehicles, were they? they oh, these sorry, yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, don't worry. I'm not uh, teaching a, you know, my grandma. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm talking to the wrong guy for this. I've driven an electric car. No, I drove a 1905 electric vehicle. Oh my god! Wow. Oh, no, it's really wow. amazing. And then I drove a Model T Ford around Manhattan, and and uh, it broke down. Brilliant. Right. Wow. So, electric wow. Car worked so this was just a, a, a looking at a point in our history where it could have i mean can you just it's almost it's almost impossible to conceive how different the world might have been oh yeah and actually it reminds me people talk about la as a as a car town and actually i I didn't realize at all but los angeles the reason it's it's in that spread out sort of endless suburbs that was actually designed for the trolley car and electric cars yeah yeah and it wasn't it's not an internal combustion car town it's a trolley car town so again from that era as you're creating these giant cities electricity looked like it was the technology of the future the one thing i do love which is early trolley bus stuff which stuart our researcher dug up i'd never heard that before is is, because they had their cantilevered uh, connectors to overhead wires to give them the power now what happened there was something really dangerous that happened that they did work out it's basically if if something went wrong with that and the trolley bus stopped and you let people off as they stepped down off the trolley bus and made contact with the ground, they were the earth. So they were immediately what? electrocuted to a vast and fairly critical level. And so what had to happen is that the, the um, conductor on the trolley had to go, sit tight. There was a phrase he said, and then he had to earth the vehicle. He had to put out a rod that earthed it, and then you were safe to get off. But just that, so there, there were dangers involved in... <laughs> No, I'm glad I don't have to earth my Tesla yeah. now. My, yes. My yeah. And then yeah. Henry Ford came along, unfortunately, with a bit of disruptive technology. That it was a neck and neck race for uh, early on, before, as you were saying, pre World War One uh, between electric and gasoline. And they were also. It's important to remember that it was a tiny minority of people would have experienced that. I mean, there was a few thousand cars on the roads of uh, America. I don't know what the population was around 1910. In America, but it would be you know fifty million plus, and so an infinitesimally small number of people had that. Everyone still was horse drawn and or steam trains, wasn't it? That was how you got around. Oh, absolutely! Uh, in a so, wonderful era of. I mean, it's, it's bizarre to think there were more journeys probably being made in America until very recently in trains and electric vehicles in like yes. nineteen hundred than until yeah. quite recently. I mean, it's just it's tragic. And yeah. Again, we talk about LA as a, as a we talk about LA as a. a, a, a um, as a trolley bus town, you know, America, it's funny, they're falling out of love with, how America fell out, out of love with its train, its rail network is an extraordinary yeah. story because it was, you know, the trains made America. They joined that country. They made the, dis- yeah. they brought these disparate parts. They, cr- they forged a nation state out of what yeah. had been quite a loose assemblage of, of territory. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, um, and, and then the, the car comes, the, the internal combustion engine come along, Henry Ford comes along, and it was a game changer, I think, the Model T Ford. It was cheap. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then once you build that infrastructure, you know, that uh, once you build that infrastructure of refilling stations and things, as we now know, we talk endlessly about um, infrastructure of recharging and stuff. It just that that is that's a game changer, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, no. but I, and I think, it, you know, around this time, it's no coincidence that in 1901, you get the famous the, the gusher at Spindletop in yeah. uh, January 1901. And that is in some ways it's near Beaumont in Texas. And in, although oil's been around you know, forever people, yeah. the Romans knew that if you lit fire, to, lit, lit uh, some of this kind of viscous uh, fluid uh, on on fire, it would it would it would it would act as a fuel, and it was picked up around the desert in, in Arabia and stuff like that. But this gigantic find in in Beaumont, Texas, 19, January 1901, just ushered in the age of, of big oil. I mean, it was yeah. something like a hundred before they got it under control. It blew for nine days at a hundred thousand barrels a day. It was just pouring wow. oil into the sky. And wow. 
and, and as it was doing, it just that was the beginning of the Texas oil boom, and it, a, a town formed around it as it was doing that. People yeah. realised this was this was black gold. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, and then and then that was America. It was you know that America had that resource on its doorstep, and so these big, huge, unbelievably wealthy companies suddenly came into existence. And that's yeah. when I think you're lobbying, as we talked about lobbying big oil. That's when you can start to change politicians' mind. You yeah. can start. To, you put your put your thumb on the on the whatever the expression is. You can start to scale, yeah, yeah. Put thumb on the scale and make sure public spending is going one way or another. And then famously, the Royal Navy, the Royal Navy, the most powerful battle fleet in the world. It switches from coal to oil just before the First World War. Oh, and that so, long ago? I didn't know that. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. It was, yeah, and it becomes a huge strategic, you know, vital strategic resource at that point. And that's the beginning of britain and then other nations but oft lamented obsession with the middle east and, and that right. supply of oil and i would imagine then so that during the first world war then that became an incredibly important resource for the british yeah. government and the yeah, british so navy so winston churchill switches the royal navy to oil in the in the 10 years building up the first world war and right. then it becomes um, a, you know the most important natural resource i mean god remember yeah. before before that coal Britain was the Saudi Arabia of coal. So the yeah. British Revolution, the kind of fantastic, extraordinary wealth of the 18th and 19th centuries, is based on the fact that Britain is a massive energy exporter. Yeah, it's so uh, and, weird, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So weird, so weird. But it helps to explain quite a lot when you think about British history and, and world history. Yeah. So you've got an island full of coal, and and but but it, they, they work out it's going to be better for the ships, all sorts of reasons to, to move to oil. But then you've got this huge problem. And so Iran is really interesting. Iran sits alongside the British Empire in India. But Iran is an ancient, hugely sophisticated civilization. Uh, the Brits had this long, and the Iranians actually offered a prince to marry one of the daughters of George III, I think. So there is this kind of wow. long uh, sort of diploma, you know, the Iran, the Brits and the, and, and the Brits in India treat Iran, if not as an equal, as, as a serious world player. So that's why you do see um, Iran being, being sort of, you know, courted as, a, as a, an oil producing place. At that stage, less was known about the oil in Saudi Arabia, but Iran looked like a country loads of oil, but also with the infrastructure to actually access it and export it. And, you know, they were looked seen as a kind of reliable counterparty. Right. Uh, and then, and, and, but, you know, the trouble is they're on the far side of the world. So therefore Britain is just engaged. That's what drags Britain into this kind of obsession with the Middle East. David Lloyd George, after the First World War, Treaty of Versailles, talks about the Middle East and talks about oil a lot. He's like, we want that bit because that bit's got oil. Wow. Uh, the, the French can have that bit. You know, he sort of sits there with a map. <laughs> and, uh, so I think the interesting thing about oil, people like, because people in the 90s, I remember the 90s going, this is a war about oil, you know, when Saddam Hussein and Kuwait. Yeah. And you just go, actually, do you know that oil has been, oil has been at the heart of, of big, big conflicts really from, from the beginning, you know. So right. British expeditionary, British expedition into Mesopotamia in the First World War, complete disaster right. um, from the early, in the early part of the First World War. One of the biggest British empire defeats of all time at a place called Kut al Amar in Iraq. That was done largely to kind of protect, uh, well, it's, so, yeah, to protect this, this supply of oil from the Ottoman Turks during the First World War. So, so, uh, so the Tur I, I was just going to ask who the British were fighting at that at that battle so it was it was turks yeah it was turks. In, the ottoman wow. turks who controlled the extraordinary empire that lasted yeah. 500 years it stretched all the way from saudi arabia well beyond even yemen arguably to all the way up to turkey and in fact right. into southeast what we now call southeast europe you know into um you know into the into the uh the, um, the balkan Balk states and yeah yeah so that was a huge empire and, and it was in britain's interest in the 9th century that 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 survived they they propped it up hence the crimean war they didn't want the russians attacking it but in the first world war the turks very foolishly sided with the germans and so britain right. and france decided to they were going to get they were going to destroy the empire and they're going to divide it up and then you've got the endless problems of what should they give it to the arabs who helped you know lawrence arabia and the arabs prince faisal and the uh, and the hashemites who helped the british uh, throw off the turkish yoke and the brits and the french decided no let's divide it up and incorporate wow sort of loosely, but let's incorporate into into a French and, and British empire. Right. Syria, for example, went to the French, and then Jordan and other places went to the British sphere of influence. So, uh, and, and oil was, you know, it wasn't the only thing going on, but oil was really, really important in that. And yeah. then the, the Second World War is, Second World War, oil is hugely important the Second World War. By then, all the technology that we, were, that we and uh, Nazi Germany and America, everything was oil-based by then, wasn't it? It wasn't... You didn't have coal-powered battleships in World War Two. I mean, it was no. That's true. Although the, the Germans ran so low on oil at the end that they're actually using coal to make synthetic oil. It's the most right. energy-intensive process in the history, unimaginable. But yeah, <laughs> but the, one of the most effective use of bombing. You know, people talk about the bombing campaign and how, you know, how 
unethical it was, and it killed lots of German civilian stuff. I mean, one of the most effective uses of the bombing campaign was against the Ploetsi oil fields in Romania uh, right. during the Second World War. The Americans hammered these oil fields in Romania, and that just completely destroyed the German war machine's ability to go on. I mean, they were getting a fraction of the oil they needed. And, and, and again, the, the Second World War, Hitler's dream of, of empire in Russia was driven largely by oil. So, yeah. so, the, so in fact, arguably, Hitler, Hitler loses that war in the East because he couldn't decide couldn't decide whether or not to go for Moscow, which is the kind of cap the capital of, of Russia, yeah. or the Soviet Union, or St. Petersburg, which is the spiritual and cultural, uh, you know, an important city as well in the north, uh, and, and link up with his Finnish allies. That made sense. Or to go for the oil fields of the south, which is down in the Caucasus in what is now a place like the Baku. And he decides to try and do all three at once. So he launches these three strikes and they all kind of get bogged down. And they all turn to help each other. Had he just launched one strike against Moscow, people think actually the plan might have worked. But, yeah. And so that he fails to capture Moscow in the winter of 1941 because he's messing about in the south, hoping to get the oil fields. Um, he doesn't get to those either. And then in Stalin, we all had Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad is a race for oil. Stalingrad right. should be in the way. So in the summer of 1942, Hitler launches this massive effort. He kind of learns his lesson from the year before. Right. And he launches this huge effort all out effort to go for these oil fields in the Caucasus. Right. And so the German armies gallop all the way. They they cross the well, they try and cross the Volga at a place called Stalingrad and that's where they get bogged down. So that campaign is all about oil. So yeah. you know it's it's not he wanted living space and all he wanted to destroy the world Jews, but he was he absolutely obsessed with controlling oil. This was an era when it was regarded that you had to you know you had to physically own the raw materials that that you needed so you right. that's why, and, and of course that's why japan um uh, did the did pearl harbor and attack the americans they had a, they have a terrible shortage of oil they had a huge war going on in china they couldn't get any oil they couldn't find any oil in northern china or southern wow. siberia so they they uh launched their way towards the dutch colonies uh in um in indonesia which has got lots of oil and malaysia and stuff's got lots of oil wow. and that's why they had to take on the u.s pacific fleet and then the british and the dutch and the french european yeah. empires so that, I, had, that, I had no idea of that connection i had no inkling of that i mean it's now as soon as you mention it extremely obvious that japan wouldn't have any oil i mean i'd assumed i might have assumed they, that was one of the reasons they invaded china was because there was oil in china but of course there isn't or there isn't anywhere near where they would have been so that was very much, that was again, because that, I mean, it's also, I guess, important to remember that this is generally to power a war machine rather than civilian transportation. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, we, we need oil for our battleships and aircraft carriers and aircraft and everything. But, well, oddly, uh, of course, what's bizarre about these idiotic policymakers is they probably, uh, yeah, they were worried about their, their military, of course, but they wanted it because they wanted, you know, their, they wanted to grow their economies like any yeah, other. Politicians. Yeah. So, you know, it's mind-blowingly stupid that rather than just buy, rather than just not invade people and just buy oil on the open market, the Japanese yeah. launch themselves on a, on, a, on a mission of national catastrophe yeah. uh, and, um, and ended up, you know, ended up shattered atomic radiation, you know, yeah. I mean, it's terrifying. Horrendo, and all, horrendo, all, yeah. They wanted a bit of oil. Yeah. I've always been surprised. I thought we were going to see a lot more um, of the energy independence argument that would be made you know, particularly after the Gulf War and the Middle East, it's clearly yeah. so terrible. And nine eleven, like these people came from Saudi Arabia, which yeah. is being propped up by oil dollars. Like, I always thought it was a terrible idea to give money to the most horrible people on earth. Yes, in order to pollute the world. Yeah. Like, I, none of it just didn't make sense. And and actually, even as a you know ninety, which you know nineteen seventy three, there was the famous oil weapon was deployed yeah. right when the when uh, the Arab oil producing countries to uh, support or to try and defend if you like syria and egypt's attempt well during the yom kippur war to fight israel for control of the sinai desert and the golan heights the arab oil producing nations basically embargoed the sale of oil to to canada uk usa one or two other right. countries and there was this you know catastrophic the price of oil rose 400 percent yeah uh and so there was this was a shock it was an oil crisis it led to an economic downturn it had a huge effect one state in the u.s banned christmas lights the, the national speed limit was introduced the first time nixon's yes. national speed limit in the u.s 55 miles an hour 55, for trucks, which 50, is miles, yeah. 50 miles an hour for cars which i think everyone ignored but yeah. so from, from 1970 onwards it should be very obvious that if your economy is based on this thing that other people have got massive control over like Look for the alternatives, and, and the yeah. inspiring thing is, is I, my solar panels are now powering my car, as are yours. Right. Uh, we got we live on we live in a place with plenty of wind, 
plenty yeah. of tires, plenty of hydro. And I know it's not as easy as saying that, but actually it's, we've seen that installed winds now. I mean, I yeah. follow you on Twitter and I follow all the accounts you recommend. If you need to, if you need a, a, a kilowatt of energy tomorrow, it, wind is now the cheapest and quickest way of achieving that. It's amazing. Yeah. It takes less time than building a gas-fired power station. Oh, God, and, yeah. And yeah. it's now competitive with that. So yeah. it's super exciting. It's really, yeah. really exciting. And and it's local. It's right next to us. You know, when there is now a really genuinely viable alternative. You know, I think 20 years ago, a wind turbine was small, quite expensive, took years to pay back. Same with solar panels. I mean, that you know, the economics of it have changed. And I think the public attitudes are only now beginning to catch up. You know, it is, and that's, that's happening globally as well. I mean, it is, people are sudden, slightly now realising, oh, I see. It actually would, if I had solar panels on my roof, it will save me money. You know. Yeah, well, that's the that's the dream, and, yeah. and 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 that's the you know the mission. I kind of I, I sense with Tesla that you're not asking anyone to sacrifice. You're, you're just saying we're going to produce a better car than all the yeah. other cars. Yeah, uh, it's going to yeah. be competitively priced, and 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 I like and I, I know I know the other car manufacturers doing that now as well. But that's how it feels. That's how we're going to beat this thing. Right? I mean, I don't know that there's any lessons we can learn from that sort of that early period of, of electric vehicle development i think that yeah. if you're asking what the kind of lessons from history i think it's i think they're pretty clear which is that um what one is don't don't be surprised how disruptive the technology can be yeah, uh, yeah. We, we we moved from whale oil so to so whaling uh yeah. was a, that that was the that was the black gold of its generation of its era in the 19th century the whale the whaling towns of, of new england were like the like the sort of glittering cities in the desert that we see today yeah. in the Middle East. And they're not anymore. You know, that, that, yeah. that died almost overnight um, when it was replaced by kerosene, which is so, petro you know, a petroleum um, derivative. Uh, and, and so that's one thing. Like, and and if, if you look at the streets of New York City, horses and electric cars within 10 years had disappeared yeah. and, and seemed like a permanent feature. You know, the, the conversation in New York were all about what you do with all the horse poo in the street, yeah. especially in the winter. You know, this was the in 10 years gone, just gone. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at, mo I, I mean, in the same way you look at mobile phone usage. I mean, you and I have made a program in India. We've worked in one of, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Mumbai. And I was very struck yeah. by how many people had a smartphone. Had a, you know, in, children, uh, children uh, with uh, smartphones. Ch children in, in, in yeah. very, very straightened circumstances yeah. had, had pretty advanced phones. Yeah. Uh, and so, and at that, the penetration of, of smartphones into the world is, is astonishing as well. Um, and then, so, so don't underestimate just how quick it'd be. And then lastly, uh, this is came from looking at the Apollo mission for my podcast and stuff recently, but it, the, if there is, the lesson from the 20th century is if you have an engineering problem, you can solve it by expending resources on it, right? Right. So, so Rose, some a, a, ph a physicist came to FDR, came to Roosevelt and said, I believe that we could harness the power of the atom to create a weapon of unimaginable destruction. And Roosevelt just went, well, well, here's the GDP of a small nation to get yes. it done. <laughs> and within three years, it was done, right? Yeah, yeah. And the same is true of the Apollo mission. So Kennedy says, we're going to the moon. At that stage, no technology existed that allowed that to happen. And there were, right. frankly, no viable plans for it to happen. And eight years later, they were on the moon. Yeah. I mean, that was phenomenally expensive. But if, if, there is, if it's an engineering problem, we can solve it. We yeah. can solve that. And that's exciting. And and it's great to see now that the money being invested in R&D in ba lithium bat batteries yeah. and in solar panels, for example, is starting to get to the point when you're just, it's just going to come, it's going to be like a tidal wave. And when it comes, we will wonder what on earth we're doing before. Yeah. It, yeah. It, will, it will seem extraordinary. Uh, Dan, thanks so much. That's brilliant. Are you, I've, I knew I would, because I always remember when we talked together in India, I would always, every conversation we had, I learned something. <laughs> You're well, very, no, very good at explaining that. I That's was learning brilliant. from you, man. <laughs> and I love your channel. So congratulations. Thank, oh, well, no, thank you so much for, for coming on. And, and I hope to see you again. Well, it'd be great to see you in real life. We'll have to do a Tesla meetup one day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. Well, again, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I had a brilliant time talking to Dan. He is an amazing guy. Uh, we Hopefully, we will get him on again we're driving a sort of 1906 electric vehicle. That's, you know, we've got to be able to do it one day. Uh, that's all we've got time for. Uh, you know, please do subscribe. Have a look at the Patreon link if you're interested. Check out the YouTube membership thing that we're just launching. And uh, that's about it, really. As always, uh, if you have been, thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.